there's something specific about Amazon, both in terms of the just unprecedented wealth personally of Jeff Bezos? I don't mean specific in terms of it's a, all five of them are a major problem, but I mean as an opening politically right now. There's also been a lot of, uh, we interviewed Chris Smalls, who did some incredible organizing, a great personal cost and was targeted in a vicious and racist way by Amazon leadership. But there's this opportunity. I mean, on one hand, we talk about the unprecedented power of Amazon across a range. I mean, because they're not only surveilling us, they've also got these frictionless supply chains, which have these horrifying totalitarian implications for labor. But then on the flip side, and Dustin Guastala, uh, who's a labor organizer, pointed this out to us, like, well, yeah, that's totally true. And it's very dangerous and damaging. But also, um, they've got, unlike, say, Google, um, they've got thousands of people in factories in the United States and Europe, as an example, that could coordinate, that could, you know, and a growing public attention maybe even just around something as kind of tabloid as that trillion dollar mark. I mean, that, that is a new, we've culturally gotten used to the ideas of billionaires, which we shouldn't, but trillion is an, that's like a whole other like ask of people. I think that's going to be one of the big issues of the next decade. It's got to become one. Uh, I mean, I think that in communication, there are three great issues that are going to be at the center of politics. One is dealing with that cartel and control over access to the internet. We've got to get rid of them make it like the post office. The second is dealing with these big five monopolies. I think we have to get, we have to deal with them, uh, probably get rid of them and nationalize certain aspects of what they do. But I, there's not a simple solution, but that amount of economic power and wealth is unacceptable. Any way you slice it, it's gotta be dealt with. It's too much. And now they're, like you said, the, the old days of like the CEO playing hacky sack with his multicultural workers in the parking lot at lunchtime, those glory days. That's, you know, the, the, now we're the, the, the Peter Thiels of the world who have big contracts with the Pentagon, uh, who are like the richest people in the world who buy and sell politicians like you, you probably did baseball cards 25 years ago. Uh, that's the reality of these people. And the next generation is like, they're capitalists. Capitalism trumps hippie at, at, at that level. Uh, so, we're gonna to have to deal with them. And then the third area is one we haven't talked about, which is the complete collapse of journalism as a commercially viable institution, not just in the United States, but it's a global phenomenon. The, the commercial system of journalism is dead. And we have very few working journalists today uh, per capita in the United States compared to a generation ago. And what few remain are all on, on really on, on death watch right now because of the economy. Uh, and we're testing a theory. Can you actually have a functional society? People have no means of uh, information to know what's going on. Uh, we're testing that theory. They're going to rely on Twitter and tweets uh, from people to tell them how they should feel. Uh, I, by the way, I framed that rhetorical question. You know my answer. Uh, <laughs> and the, one of the nice things about American history uh, and about democratic theory is that you don't have to be an expert to understand really early on, everyone who's ever dealt seriously with having to have a self-governing society has made having an independent, functional, credible information system, journalism, as mandatory. It wasn't like, hey, maybe we'll luck out and get one. No, it's like, if you don't have that, nothing else can work. That's the oxygen of a free society, of a functional society. And we really don't have that oxygen now. We just have farts in the air uh, for the most part but very little oxygen. What's the strategy for that? Well, I think the problem with journalism is why the commercial model is failed. Journalism is a public good. It's something society desperately needs, but the market doesn't generate in sufficient quality or quantity. And the framers understood that. In the 19th century, we had enormous subsidies to give us an independent free press, postal subsidies. Almost all newspapers were distributed through the mails and they basically were distributed for free. So they took the entire cost of distribution out of newspaper publishing, which meant we had many more newspapers per capita than any other country in the world. And it was the foundation of our, our politics. That's how you did political work with newspapers. If you went into any major city in, in 1870, there were 15 or 20 daily newspapers, different languages. I mean, it was you were just rife in this culture uh, of, of information. And what happened was that those subsidies began to disappear when you could start making money publishing and big time money came with the rise of modern capitalism and advertising. 
And advertising gave the illusion that journalism could be really profitable. These best fortunes, Scripps, Pulitzer, Hearst, became billionaires or 100 millionaires uh, with these monopoly newspapers all over the country. Uh, but then when the internet came along, uh, all that advertising left newspapers. And it became clear that actually that was a fluke that advertisers had to support journalism for a brief, for a century to satisfy their commercial needs. But now in the internet era, they no longer need to. And so they pulled their support uh, from newspapers and from all journalism. And the all journalism is withered on the vine as a result because it's a public good. It needs public support. Postal subsidies won't work now. But the trick with journalism policies, you have to have enough money to have uh, well-paid, independent, credible, competing newsrooms. But the money's got to come from the public sector, but the government can't control the money. You can't allow Donald Trump to say, you get the money, or, or right. anyone. Bernie Sanders shouldn't say, you get the money. It should be, so you need public You get the money. Yeah, right. you need public money uh, without government control. And so yeah. that's the trick policy we have solved. And the, the best solution I've seen, and the one I advocate, was first developed by a wonderful economist named Dean Baker, who you've probably seen Dean's stuff, yeah. writes on a variety of issues. And he, he anticipated this before anyone else. He said, basically, we need to give every American a voucher of, of, the, of government money they can spend in any nonprofit a medium of their choice. So what I would propose is that we give every American over the age of 18, $200 of government money they can allocate to any nonprofit, non-commercial news medium of their choice, as long as it meets a few simple IRS codes and other things to prevent fraud. And, um, the, and, and I think it's going to catch on it's been, now because especially with what's happened with uh, the Black Lives Matters protests that have been going on, because one of the crises in the African-American community in rural America is what we call a news desert, something that didn't really exist 50 years ago. Now the whole country is a news desert. That's an area that has no functional reporting covering the local politics, none. Right. There literally are huge chunks of America where there is no journalism whatsoever. Not even one person really covering the area. Neighborhoods, communities, inner suburbs and cities, no one's covering them. And so what this would do, if everyone had, say, $200, uh, everyone over 18, $200, they could allocate to any nonprofit medium, it would mean, let's say you live in New York, take it. What about in Brooklyn? Let's say there was a Bedford-Stuyvesant. How many people live in Bed-Stuy? 100,000, 200,000? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Let's say they all pooled their money. Well, that's like $20 million or of, of that you put together, you could build a really nice newsroom for $10 million that just covered Brooklyn for, in Bed-Stuy. Uh, and then, you know, it'd be very competitive because if uh, they screwed up and didn't do a good job, the next year people would give their uh, grant to someone else. But it would be controlled by individuals. They wouldn't have to give if they want. They picked who got the money. Uh, the government had no control over that. So that's the direction. It would be, a, it would be like a government-backed commons for journalism. It would be basically. government subsidy, but people control who gets the money and how it's used. Right. And if they determine if they like it or don't like it. It's not, the government has no control over that. Just using neutral criteria, which already exists by the Internal Revenue Service for who would qualify. Uh, they have actually a pretty advanced system there for donors and all to deal with. What, you know, the follow-up question and the last thing I want, I would really like to hear your thoughts on it. It's, one of the things that's interesting in the journalism conversation right now, and I think also reflects Bernie and Trump and all of these conversations, is what I call the pre and post critique. And especially like in 2016, occasionally Trump would say these things that were true and they were surprising to hear from somebody who could be president, but the upshot was very different. So let me make a, a actual example. One time he was on Fox News, I think with Bill O'Reilly, and they were talking about Russia. And he said, what, you don't think the United States, you don't think we kill people? I remember it well. Yeah. And it was, and it was, it was cathartic. It was funny and it was true. And of course, unlike uh, you, let's say, or Bernie for that matter, who might be willing to say that, the follow-up would be, and that's wrong. And we're going to attempt to change our foreign policy. Trump was we all do it. Let's stop bullshitting. Let's say what it is, which I un, I think the appeal of that is particularly before the guys actually governed is makes a lot of sense. And when we look at the implosion of media, and we look at just how you know how bad so much of it is, like like look at how they cover foreign policy. Look at how they, you know, just just so bad. 
<laughs> I sound like Trump now. And you think, what is the, the, the way that the kind of pre and post critique of things gets confused, right? Like the New York Times has, is, is awful in many, many ways and is the point. So therefore I want everything to be a personally tailored Fox News program. Or is the point that I actually want a genuinely actual, open, and truly universally representative media? And I think so many conversations now kind of conflate uh, critiques, basically, that both have some things that are true, but they point in very different directions. But in both cases, they kind of point to that loss of the center or the collapse of these institutions that have really undermined their own credibility and have, you know, have have let in have let the sort of have have let in let these conversations occur and then <laughs> these institutions themselves don't necessarily make the distinction you know a lot that was a big thing during the campaign oh bernie's criticizing media monopolies he's criticizing jeff bezos's power that sounds like trump yeah well that's a really that's a whole show there uh, yes <laughs> and, and more uh it's a very it gets right to the heart of some of the, the decay in our society today that didn't exist in the same way a generation ago. And, um, you know, you look at, uh, I'll, here's an example. Uh, in 2016, I live in Wisconsin. Uh, Trump spent a lot of money advertising in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. When they realized they had a chance to win here, they funneled a lot of ads here in the last uh, uh, two or three weeks of the campaign for election day. Hillary was doing nothing here. She was convinced she was going to win. She's planning her uh, award speech or victory speech or something. Didn't campaign here at all. Well, on TV, if you were to watch a Trump ad in those last few weeks, with the exception of a brief, relatively brief segment of it that would be about immigrants, the rest of it was a Bernie ad. It was about corruption, money and politics, politicians who don't care about you, crazy wars that make no sense. It was a Bernie ad. That's what he went on. And you know, he didn't run on, let's balance the budget, cut Social Security, get rid of public education. None of that stuff. He ran a Bernie ad, except for the immigration stuff. That, that, was, that was his one nod. Right. Uh, and the point is that right-wing populist movements are not traditional conservatives. They're, they are, you know, in their pure form, fascist. They have a very strong populist element to them. And people they appeal to have a lot of anger at those above them uh, as much as those below them. You know, the problem, among others, of all these fascist movements is invariably when they get in power, they become tools of those above them. They never, that's always BS, always, without exception, BS. Uh, and that's true with Trump and Bolsonaro and Hitler, Mussolini, all of them fit into that. But, but I mean, that's sort of... So yeah, you're watching that Trump ad in, in November, October of 2016, and you're watching Hillary's ad, which is your whatever she's doing, and you're going, well, this guy, Trump's talking about the world I'm living in, at least. She's right. talking about the world she's living in and her funders live in. It has nothing to do with me. It's just the usual political BS I've heard for the last 40 years. And you can see why he would have appeal to people who are frustrated, uh, who, who aren't fascist, but who are frustrated. Yeah, and how and how that that really important sort of that those things get conflated in, in in terms of critique. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com/slash/tmbs.